Racial attacks are not a thing of the past. Well, just recently, Nathan Maluleke was beaten with a golf club in an alleged racial attack. Well, the big question now is what needs to happen for the country to completely recover from the impact of the apartheid era? Well, for uh, more on the story, we speak to Daily Maverick columnist Jacques Rousseau, uh, who's in our Cape Town studios. A very good morning to you, Jacques. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, what immediately came to mind when I heard of this Nathan Malulego story for me was just how many people are walking around in South Africa with that same mindset. I mean, you have uh, before 1994, people were brain if I can call it that, into believing that other races were subhuman. Now, post-1994, we expect everything to just vanish and for all of us to live together in harmony. Have we done enough as a country to ensure that real reconciliation comes to pass? Morning, Ayanda. No, I don't think we have. And part of the problem is, I mean, as you highlight with the previous brainwashing, I think that's to some extent been replaced by another kind of brainwashing from which we haven't recovered. And the, the rhetoric of the rainbow nation and the idea that uh, we can reach a negotiated compromise on everything has, in a sense, taken up our consciousness for so many years that we haven't developed the resources and the tools to actually debate and discuss things rationally and come to an agreement. So what's happened, I think, is that a kind of bullying or threatening has, has taken the place of, of that negotiated compromise. I mean, take the, the FNB ads as an example. Our, our standard response to things we don't like is to shout at each other. And in that sort of climate, it's not very likely that we are going to calm these tempers down. It seems like we're such an angry society. I just want to quickly play a clip for you. Now, I know you can't see it from our Cape Town studio, so I'll quickly describe what's happening there. You have violent protests where uh, police officers open fire. There you have it, a police officer opening fire with what looks to be live rounds of ammunition there. Uh, you're seeing rocks being hurled at him. This is a service delivery protest or a, a protest over demarcation, and yet it turns so ugly so quickly. It seems like we're such an angry society. Do you think we need uh, some sort of mass therapy session? I'm not, I'm not sure to what extent that will help. I mean, the people in that sort of clip, the people there are legitimately angry because they aren't being provided with things they've been promised for a long time, with basic goods and services that we all need and, and in a sense, deserve. So we've, we've got to separate those two kinds of anger. And the one kind of anger is legitimate, and the other kind of anger that we mostly talk about in the media is this kind of middle-class rage that you see on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. And in those sorts of cases, the latter sorts of cases, much of the time we should really just shrug it off because it's not really, our, our problems are more deeper, are, are, more, are deeper and more systemic than those. And the, the service delivery protests are a different sort of anger and a far more serious kind of anger and I, I think a very legitimate kind of anger. Now, my next question is not to excuse any racial tensions, but more to understand the psyche of someone with racial uh, tendencies or racist tendencies, I should say. Do you think th issues such as affirmative action and BEE have sort of pushed some white people, to be exact, up against a wall to an extent where they, ca they can't express themselves in any way except to, to lash out in, in the way that we see the woman did in Nathan Malulega's instance? That's, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, that's, I think that's a very good highlighting of exactly what our problem is. So in the beginning, in the, in the kind of rosy days of democracy, the white community by and large bought into a lot of that project. And slowly their goodwill has whittled away, not because, I mean, partly because they, in a sense, haven't seen the fruits of, the la uh, fruits of those labors for the country as a whole. They haven't seen the upliftment of poverty and the better education and so forth. So that goodwill is eroding and it's led to a enhancement of the kind of hyperbole I was talking about a moment ago. So take the SAA cadet scheme last year, or the Woolworths affirmative action scandal, if one could use such a silly word for, for that. Both of those cases were entirely legitimate uses of employment programs to try to redistribute jobs and redistribute wealth and so forth. And they get called reverse racism in absurd terms like that. The point is that if it's premised on trying to equalize things, and if it's a justified and responsible sort of way of trying to allocate jobs to certain sectors, it's not a kind of racism. It's an attempt to get out of racism. It's an attempt to recover from racism. But we use these hyperbolic and extreme labels, and that, again, inflates the tensions. And then p things like the golf club incident are a result of those inflamed tensions, those escalating, uh, the, the, the strong feelings that we have. We can't talk about things. We instead just fight. Yeah, Jacques, it, it is a very sensitive topic to go around. And even while we were planning our way around this one, we thought we should tread carefully. And I mean, I know one or two people are probably thinking, not this again. When are we ever going to get over this? And that's a question I'm posing to you. Do you think as a country we're ever going to get over racial tensions? 
We, I, th I think we won't completely. I think no country who's had this sort of history ever does completely, but I think we can marginalize it. We can make it something that occurs in the, in the kind of, uh, in little pockets of society rather than being the systemic thing. But I would urge us all to stop being so impatient about this. I mean, I teach first year students at the University of Cape Town, and so last year's students were the first of the so-called born frees, and this year is a whole other bunch of them. And they haven't had the advantages that people like me have had growing up, by and large. It's absurd for us to expect that 18, 19 years after democracy, everything is now suddenly magicked into equality, that everybody is now free and equal and equally educated and all of those sorts of things. We're being far too impatient. We're thinking that 994 was some sort of magic wand. So I think we can get a lot better. We can't ever heal completely, but getting better is still going to take us a long time. Very quickly, you have our children not seeing color. I mean, the young ones today play with each other as if nothing ever happened. And yet you see some of them, when they do grow older, carry some of the sentiments of the parents. What do you think our role is as parents in order to make sure that those racist divides are not further entrenched into the next generation? Well, my personal solution is to get away from this discourse of identity politics entirely, to stop talking about race, to stop talking about black and white and so forth, and to deal with the real issue, which is socioeconomic classes, to try to make sure we've all got an equal chance of a good life, regardless of what we look like. Thank you so much. Short, sweet, and to the point. That was Daily Magbreaker, columnist Jacques Rousseau.